Welcome to A Tale of Two Scribes. I'm your host, Eric P. Bishop. This is a podcast where interesting people come and tell about the stories they've crafted. As for myself, I'm an author. I've created novels, short stories, novellas, and even poetry. If you'd like to find out more about what I've done, please go to my website, ericpbishop.com. Thanks, and enjoy the journey. Welcome back to another episode of A Tale of Two Scribes. Today, I'm pleased to bring on the podcast Dave Buzan. Hey, Dave, how are you? Hi, Eric, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, Thanks for so, Yeah, absolutely, glad to have you. Um, want to talk with you today about your book, In the Layer of Legends. But before we get to that, which is very important, that's what we're going to discuss. And I, the book's back here. So I printed off a sheet here, but I want to read a couple things. And this comes from your acknowledgments. Um, okay. Like we talked a little bit about off air. Um, to me, the acknowledgments are a really big deal in a book. It's actually the first thing when I get someone's book, I always flip to the backs of the acknowledgments. Um, okay. Sometimes they're in the front of the books. But to me, I, I like to see who they're going to thank. I like to see the tone. And I, in a way, to me, and it's a very personal thing, but it sets the tone for the book, I believe. Wow. So a couple things that I really that stood out to me um, when you're talking about uh, Lieutenant Winterhawk, you said he was right. Hope is the long road to travel. My sincere wish is that knowing the struggles it took for me to reach this point might bring encouragement to others who find themselves stuck in the creative trenches. I hope that it might bolster the spirits of those who have worked so hard for years and feel that there's nothing at all to show for it. I implore you to not give up. Keep going. If you get knocked down, climb back onto your feet again. Investigate other creative outlets. Feed that part of yourself before it starves. Hope is a superpower. Never take off that cape. So, um, golf clap. <laughs> I Thank you. Loved it. I read that before I read the book. And to me, again, that set the tone for it. And I said, okay, I'm going to dive into this book and I'm going to be inspired. And I knew I'd be inspired simply because you started the process or ended the process whenever you wrote your acknowledgments. But the important part of the acknowledgments is encouraging other people. So why was that important to you to include what we just read or what I just read? On the creative process, there's as many dead ends as there are trails to take. And it's difficult over the years as the rejections pile up or as the disappointments pile up mm -hmm. to find that motivation to keep going. Yeah. And uh, it's important because I've seen so many people stop and never start again. Uh, and I, that just was important for me to end because I know a lot of people would be reading this particular book, knowing my own journey, how long it took. And I just wanted them to have that sense of, you know, pride and courage, um, inspiration that if I could do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. No matter what the endeavor is, you know, uh, yeah. just keep going. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's why I ended the acknowledgments that way. Because that, that's what kept me going, that inner that inner belief. Well said, well said. And I, I think the beauty, I, I've talked about this with some other folks, is the beauty of something like writing, what you've done, is there's really no age limit. There's no, really, there's no starting point. You get people that publish books, young people do sometimes nowadays, especially with the technology we have, it's a lot easier. But even, you know, 100 years ago, uh, children had that, that had the ability to write and read had that option to tell their stories. And probably more so, they would write stories out than even our youth do now, because they didn't have these crazy things that are probably destroying all of our lives in some ways. Um, but then you have someone like I saw something the other day. It was I don't remember exact age. It was a woman that was getting published. I think she was 91 or 92. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time she ever got anything published. And, you know, I look at that as someone who I got published at 40. Five, 44, 45. I think it was 45. Should know that uh, whatever 2021 was for me. Um which, you know, in some ways was a little bit late uh, to, to some, but then to the person that's 92 years old that gets published for the first time, I was a, I was a young whippersnapper doing it. Um, so I definitely think just what you put in there is powerful because to those that are listening to this, you, you, you might not have all the time in the world, and none of us do, but you do have the ability to 
whatever your dream is to keep going and to reach that goal. Um, and I, I think, I think more, I think people give up and I think people give up obviously because the road gets hard. Um, they might get discouragement from friends, family, or those in their circle. Um, but I tell you what, if they, if they just stick with it, you know, they can have a book out. You never know. That's right. I mean, I was 51 when my, when my book was published. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's late for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. just like you were saying, uh, but compared to, you know, others, yeah, but it was in the right timing for me, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I was going to say, you don't see too many, you, you do in, 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 in what we write in the fiction realm, you do see people obviously in their twenties sometimes get published. Um, but that's even almost an anomaly. There's not a lot. I think the majority of people that go down that path, are more towards not not necessarily middle age, but they're getting that direction that 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 point. And I think that's because the experience it takes to be able to craft something that's worthy of publishing takes a while. I think life experiences um, help really shape authors. Um, those don't happen as much when you're 16, 17, 18. They accumulate. And then when you get into your 30s and 40s or even 50s, I think you have a lot more to uh, to draw back on when you go to write a story. I think a lot of it too is finding your own voice. I think it takes a while to get through. A lot sure. of times uh, you're just emulating your favorite writers or, mm -hmm. or yeah, your favorite tone. Um, so I just think that's also a big part of the process is just finding your own uniqueness yeah. and comfortable with that voice. Mm -hmm. it's not really easy. So let's talk about your voice. Um, Cause you uh, started off screenwriting. Is that where you, is that was, was your first writing chops broken there or was it well when i was a junior in high school in 1989 um i published my first short story okay so i was starting to write and publish for short stories back then mm -hmm. so into my early college years i was doing uh, magazine articles i had things published in like american cinematographer and the james mm -hmm. bond 07 fan club and film score mm -hmm. monthly and those kinds of things but i always wanted to be a filmmaker so I actually went to the Vancouver Film School where I graduated from. That was a two-year program, 93, 94. And I graduated in 94. And six months later, secured my first uh, agent and had a series of three agents over the next 15 years of working in that, that field. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was really interesting. Screenwriting is great. You have to be so exact, so precise. Uh, you can't dawdle on things. You have to really condense. You can't be on the nose. Um, it's, it's just really fascinating. And when you do like action screenplays like I did primarily, mm -hmm. it's more arduous of a task, even more difficult, which was like go 20 years later when I'm starting this novel. That was a hard part of actually starting it was like, it's okay, Dave, you can add more. You can actually say what he's thinking or feeling and, and, that was the most difficult part because mm -hmm. you know, I always want to edit that out right away. How do right. I how do say it without saying it kind of thing? Well, no, I can say it. You can say it now. Yeah. 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 But screenwriting was, uh, was fascinating. Um, I had some options. Um, we had a lot of close calls. Mm -hmm. It just kept, kept me going. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of heartache, a lot of, a lot of heartache. Mm -hmm. I had one famous time where my agent um, called me to say, pick out your beach house. We're there. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, and it didn't work out, right? Um, a bunch of those kind of led to me being disenchanted. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually walked away from it after 15 years. Okay. Yeah. I just, there was so much heartache. It's just one of those things that I did in my head. I was like, I just can't continue this anymore. And I actually stepped away for a while. So how does that, so maybe for people that don't, because I, I know a little bit about it just through fellow authors that have um, either either done screenwriting as well, or they've dabbled in trying to get their works turned into um, something on the Hollywood side or a screen, or they've had screenwriters be, take interest in it. So maybe you can explain to the listeners. So from a screenwriter perspective, you're writing a script and then you could get paid for a script or for, for creating that script or you're under contract to maybe write a script from someone, but it does not mean that it's going to make it to development or be optioned for, by any of the studios or producers, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, my era of working on it was 1995 through the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Okay. 
And so you query letters to all the agents. Um, once an agent likes your script, usually they want to see more than one. You always have to have two or three before you can get an agent. And once you're signed, um, like when I was signed my first agent, you know, it's like, oh, parade time, it's over. Everything's great, right? But that was when the real battle had started. Yeah. Because then they have to pitch it to various producers or directors or so on. And right. that, that process is just a monumentally exciting slash heartbreaking experience. Because mm -hmm. you wake up in the morning and you say, hey, Michael Douglas is reading my script, you know? And then Michael Douglas passes on the script. Right. You you have to you have to get used to that. Okay. Yeah. One of my, I won't I won't tell you who it is, but a real famous, real famous Hollywood producer that, uh, called my agent to say thank you for the toilet paper. That was the roughest turndown I ever got, and this was oh a big. Okay, but wow, that same week, a really big director. Um, said about my script that one of the best action scripts he's ever read and that that was one of my first options came from that so you just have to be willing to to be accepting that someone's not going to like your work right and have faith enough in your work it's like i knew my agent i mean at the very bare bones they each thought they could make money off my work right sure so it's a business so yeah. it's not like oh he, dave's a nice guy i'm just going to represent him that's just not how it works. Yeah. So you, that that kind of kept me going. You just mm -hmm. focus on all the good news you got. Focus on all the positives. Mm -hmm. And you need to take the negatives along the way. Yeah. So you basically were starting in that field and then transitioning over to an author. Um, in some ways, it's not very different because obviously writing is writing. Now, there's different mediums that you do it in, but it's very similar for writing novels where if you want to get an agent, you know, you have to pitch an agent, you pitching them a manuscript, and then you can have, and I, I felt that experience as well, where I'd have one agent be, I remember there's a couple uh, with the body man, actually, with uh, the one that got, got published, I'd have an agent say, man, the, the action here and the story is just so well said, but the dialogue is just not believable. Like I, I spent like an hour and a half with a really well-known agent. I had it, I thought I had him hook, line and sinker, pitched it to him. We were, I was down in Charleston. I thought, man, this is it. This my, and the response I got back was just the dialogue is not believable. And then like within that week, another agent had finally got back to me and they're like, man, the dialogue's great. I'm just having trouble with the story. And I'm like, Okay, that's the complaint. I think that's when the light bulb for at least me went off. And I was just like, this is so subjective. You know, one person might think you just wrote the the greatest piece of literature in the world, and the next person says, Hey, thanks for the toilet paper. <laughs> so yeah. it's that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It, it is. It really is. Yeah. It's just it boils down to having the faith in yourself and the belief in yourself. And you just yeah. gotta keep when you hear those things. You know, and, and let's be real, if every single person that read it told me it was toilet paper, you know, it's tough to find the uh, the fortitude to keep going. You, Absolutely. So it really depended on the honest and and it really, to be frank, the praise of, you know, strangers. Correct. Yeah. Wait, this is really good. This is really great. It's like, oh, thank you. So, yeah. you know, that's what I have to focus on. That's what I still focus on because, as you know, not, not every review we get is wonderful from readers or critics. <laughs> We, really we get bad ones <laughs> yeah yeah we even i those winter hawk occasionally gets his own bad ones believe me <laughs> well i tell you what though and the i don't look at very many of the reviews especially on amazon i'll read a couple here and there i was told your uh mark cameron gave me some advice right before the body man came out um and he said don't read your reviews and don't look at your sales numbers um fortunately the with, the, with going through a publisher i didn't see the sales numbers very often quarterly, I guess is what I saw them. So I didn't have, now I'm on the opposite spectrum with doing, putting stuff up myself. I can check my sales numbers every 30 seconds if I so choose, um, which is, Mark was right. It's not very healthy to be looking at your sales numbers very often. Um, but yeah, I, I stuck with that for the most part of not looking at very many reviews. I've looked at, definitely read some, um, at least for me, what's meant a lot now recently with some of the more recent uh, books I've done or stuff I'm putting out there is trying to get really good advanced readers that um, might know me from the body man or might not, and just get like real readers opinions on something 
before it gets too far in the process. Um, I don't know that to me is means a lot more than in some ways giving it to someone that's seasoned um, is I, I want that. I want that feedback from a reader that's going to be actually out there buying, hopefully buying the book. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I feel the same way. So when you're um, let's jump back to screenwriting world for a minute. So while you're doing that and for 15 years, you're, you know, you're, you're hoping that beach house comes true and um, you're, you're really putting, you know, put it, putting your, your future in some ways in this endeavor. Are you working a full-time job? I am as well. You are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just like today, just like then, you know, Okay. waiting for that time when writing becomes the full-time job. Yeah. So screenwriting is no different than writing novels. I would do it, you know, sometimes all night writing sessions, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, wait early in the morning. Um, agents and producers always had notes. They always had things you had to change. So gotcha. uh, the script's never done. It depends on who's reading it. Right. And a good a good screenwriter is always flexible, always willing to pivot. You know, uh, especially on the specs or the they're called they call them specs, so they're like okay. not asked for. They're ones that I created to send out. Mm -hmm. But when you're going like that, it's just a million different opinions, and it's like you know, oh, it should be done this way, or once you have this character, it'd be better this. So I mean, there were some scripts I probably rewrote 17, 18 times, wow. just just to get that you know flow of the way they wanted it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was always the most difficult part was juggling that jobs, just like it is. Just, yeah. 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 yeah I think that's the other thing. And I, I, I think the folks are savvy enough now to realize that for the majority of writers out there, this isn't their, that's not their only gig. Um, and maybe for, you know, for some either make enough to provide for themselves and their family or possibly their, significant other makes has a good income and they can stay home and they can be you know a stay-at-home writer or whatever um but yeah i think the vast majority probably like 90 something percent of people um are at least doing something else besides writing mm -hmm. sure um which i there's a positive and negative to that i i've i've wondered myself if i get to the stage where writing can pay the bills how that might change for me mentally because right now in in a way i don't have to risk very much um, i'm going to write no matter what until i don't have the mental fortitude to ever do it again but i don't need to write to put food on the table um and so i, I have wondered over the last several years of if that flipped on me and that the income came in good for writing and i could quit my my day job my corporate job um how that would change knowing that the pressure of you better that 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 next book better be really good because yeah. the other one's not paying out much anymore and it's the next one that you're going to need to pay your mortgage payment and your car payment and your kids keep you know keep your kids alive um so yeah it's just a it, it, i think that's a good problem to have but that's not a problem that the vast majority of writers even have to face just just the nature of how how the business works unfortunately yes yeah, I had read that as well. It's only 10% of writers can make that a full-time gig. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you I went down the rabbit hole a couple of years ago of and it's it's hard because you know, sales numbers are obviously something that's kind of a, in a way guarded. Um, but some of the big uh publishers weekly, uh some of the some of the periodicals out there have put numbers out the last 10 years or so and they're staggering. They're staggering how small they actually are. Like I think the number from and several years back, but it's probably not changed dramatically in the last several years is there's 10 books or less that sell a million copies. Mm -hmm. Now, a million copies sounds like a lot of copies, but when you're talking about what's 8 billion people on the planet, a million copies ain't that much, you know, and in comparison. Um, and then what was it? Something like 500 authors or less sell over 100,000 copies, I think. Um, and if you start actually looking at the numbers of how much you earn off of royalty for a book um, versus how much you would need to sell to maybe supplement your income or to be a full-time position, um, it's kind of daunting. It, it is. It, yeah. it really is. So you have to love doing this. That's what, And that's what I've tried to tell people. Look, if, if you're coming into this because you think it's get-rich-quick scheme, you're foolish. Or if you're coming into this because you think this is where the money's at, 
you're even more foolish. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's like, yeah. no, you have to do this because you love this. So I had a very successful author I was going back and forth with recently. And, and, and they told me that the ironic part is you see people's names on the New York Times bestseller list and people that don't know might think, wow, that person, they've reached the pinnacle. They've got it. And this, this author told me, the UPS guy delivering their books to their front step probably is making more money than a lot of the people that are hitting the New York Times bestseller list. Um, so, you know, that's it puts it in perspective. And some people could look at that and go, well, that's really negative, but that shouldn't be. I think for those of us that are writing, that should hopefully give us the, the push or the desire to, you know what, I, I want to be the exception of the rule. Well, how are you the exception of the rule? And some people say, well, you get lucky or you do this and that. Only thing you have control in this whole thing. There's only one thing you have control. It's what you create. And if you can create something that is the best thing you have and several good things happen and you keep hustling, anything's possible. But That's you right. have to you have to finish that book. You have yeah. to you have to craft the best book possible. Yeah. And then George Clooney recently said in an interview, um, he was talking about being inspired. And he said, you don't want to reach that stage in life where you look back and you say, I could have done it. Right. Wish I would have done it. And he said, but it's okay to fail. At least you can say, I tried. Mm -hmm. I tried the best I could. Yes. And I, I just couldn't quite make it. But I, I agree with that. There's there's two schools of thought for that. Yeah. I would much rather be the person that that tries than not try. Yeah. But you have to you have to go in. There's a lot of people that start a book, start a script, um, they can't finish it. Mm -hmm. they, they just do not have what it takes to finish it. So, right, uh, yeah, it's, there's that reality too. You know, you yeah. just you have to be realistic with what your goals are and what you're trying to finish. You know, so I think a lot of people aren't aren't that realistic. True, absolutely, and I think this if. One thing that I definitely learned, because I was very ignorant, I finished my first novel in 2014. Um, I wrote three novels before I actually got the Body Man, uh, or deal for the Body Man. So it, I think it was seven, six to seven years from when I finished the first novel before the Body Man got published. With I, I believe it was seven years. So, you know, pretty long. That's, you know, it's in the scheme of your life, you, you don't have hundreds of seven-year time periods. <laughs> you know, you have... Right. You know, you, the multiples on that aren't, aren't, aren't a large number, basically. Um, but as I got through that first book and when I was going through the process of finishing that, I realized what I didn't know. And you don't know what you don't know in life. Well, then I had to learn. Like when I first queried my, you know, agents, I remember one of the early responses I got from one of the agents is like, yeah, you know, this is, you know, OK, this is this sounds really interesting. The first 50 pages are great. And then the next question was, what's your social media presence? And I was at 2000, that was late 2014, I guess, maybe early 15. Um, and, you know, my thought was social media is for suckers. I've, I've got Facebook, but I hate it. Why would I have social media? And they're like, yeah, come back when you have 10,000 Twitter followers. Come back when you have a website. And they gave me kind of a list of like almost like goals to have from a social media standpoint. And I was just kind of like, well, I just wanted to write a book. <laughs> and I wanted, you know, I wanted the dump truck to pull in and like, you know, it back, you know, it, it tip up and money just comes out. That's not how this works. <laughs> no, that's and, and however many years later now, 10 years, it'd be 10 years since I first finished the first book this, uh, this September would be 10 years. It's dump truck still hasn't arrived. So that's okay though. It's, it's, it, it is okay. So, um, but like you were saying too, and what I agree is the, most people don't stick to it, but if you do, and if, if you can, then you can have a shelf of books. You get to have a book. And at least for me, that's a legacy I can leave behind. It's something I wanted to do for so many years. So whether that be one book or a lifetime of books I get to write from that time that first one publishes, you're able to leave something behind, which I think is pretty powerful. Very, yeah. yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about agents. I. So the, the difference between uh, 95 to the era that I was doing it mm -hmm. is they just wanted genres. Like, that's it. 
Right. So when I finished in the layer of legends and I wasn't really going to send it out to agents. I was just wanting not to do that again. And I was just kind of exploring the process, if you will. And right. to meet the new agents, it was almost like a dating site. Like they were asking, there was all these things like I'm, I'm like walks on the beach and I'm like this kinds of music. And I was like, who cares? <laughs> you know, what, what kind of books are you looking for? Like, why, why would that interest me? Right. And then, and they were, they were the list of what they don't want was gigantic. Yeah. You know, we only want a, a hero that's like this and only want a hero that looks like this or acts like this. And we don't, you know, I had one actually, there was one on there that said, if you have JDO Christian values, we don't want to, in the book, we don't want to read it. Right. Yes. Just flat. So, flat out. yeah, I just, I just couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I was shocked. Right. It's like, how am I going to get this book out into the world if I have to deal with this, this hundred right. percent. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wasn't prepared for that because that that's how much it had changed in between my writing time. Well, again, the the internet world, the the age of technology completely transformed publishing. And and I think I think we're still kind of in the early years of it transforming um more, dramatically more. Uh, AI, I think obviously that's something I'm just I don't I'm I'm pretty ignorant to it to some degree, but I'm starting to have to research it more for for novels honestly going forward. Um but the 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 rate of how things have changed in the process um, is is pretty dramatic and it's a double edged sword. It used to be that you could publish a book and that's all you had to do was write the book. Now that's part of what you have to do. But you know whether you're a no name person or you're someone that is going to make the New York Times bestseller list, you have to be out there promoting the book. You have to be. You have to be doing stuff like this. You have to be well, open to doing podcasts or interviews or print print you know interviews, whatever it might be. Um, very few people get to skip that that step anymore because they want you available. And there's so many avenues out there for people because that's the other thing that's changed too. Is now, you know, literally, and I've told this to people before, and they've kind of laughed, but I'm like, really, like, start. Let, let's say on Monday this week. I start writing myself a, a novella. I could write, I have a day job, but let's say I took the week off. I could write a 25, 30,000 word novella in one week. No problem. As long as I got an idea in my head, I could do that. Should it be published? That's a different conversation. But could I do it? Yes. By Friday night, I could go on Canva. I could create a cover. And by Saturday morning, I could upload that to Amazon and it could be available for sale by the following Monday morning. Again, should that be published? Absolutely not. Worth less than the toilet paper that you were told about that script. Much yeah. less. But yeah. I could then say, hey, I published something. And it could be out there. And I could start charging. And some some dummy might buy it. You know, if I if the cover is not that bad or whatever. Or my write-up on it is decent. So the the means to get into the publishing world now has almost got no safeguards. If you go that route, flip side is if you do want to get an agent, you want to go with Penguin or one of the big five publishers. Um, the gatekeepers now are so, like you just said, they're so specific. You have Christian, you have Judeo Christian values in your book. Agent doesn't want to touch it. Do you have this particular whatever so in, for the character? This specific type of character. That's what we want. So it's so specialized now that, you know, it's it, it, it's a quandary, I think, for authors, because I think a lot of people nah, I just want to write a good story. But you've got to get that story done. And then once you get it done, man, then that's there's so many options. But a lot of those options are very limited, too. So if you wrote a story, that's one of the things, uh, one of the feedbacks I got from The Body Man, um, which, you know, eventually it got published was I had an agent reply back and they're like, man, this is really good. But it was during Trump's administration. It's like, eh, political thrillers aren't selling right now. I'm looking at the New York Times bestseller list and I'm seeing three political thrillers on there. And I'm then, then, then you start wondering, OK, are they lying to me? Is the, or they think this is just a little too far out there and it's not going to get picked up and they're not going to make money. So, you know, it's just so like, and to me, that was easy that I just went wrong agent, wrong agent. And I'd rather have the wrong agent tell me no than the wrong agent be like, well, 
I can try to make money off this. No, no, no. I want an agent that if I sign with them, they think it's the great, they, they think it's Hemingway. Um, they're not, if they read my books and I could think I'm Hemingway, but want them to think that they got to believe in that because if they believe in it, there's a better chance that they're going to be able to convince a publisher to actually purchase it and sell books. Sure. Yeah. You have to have that fire. Yeah. It's, it's missing from a lot of agents um, that I've associated with. That, yeah. that, that fire, that apathy towards the business and, and right. you know, the writers in general, you know, I was really blessed that all three of my agents weren't like that. They were just, mm -hmm nurturing and great and wonderful and, and always trying to get me work and always, you know, always doing their job. So I, I didn't never had the experience a lot of writers have with bad agents. It just, you yeah. know, one, one rejection and then you don't hear from them for a year. Right. Mine is kind of fueled like, no, no, that that's wrong. That's wrong. This is, this is good. We're going to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a, the other thing too, is in talking to some authors, I know some authors that have gotten agents over the years and the manuscripts haven't sold though. And I remember how excited they were that they got an agent and I was excited for them as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, do you want to have an agent or do you want to have a book out? Um, that's not always the same thing. <laughs> it doesn't always, you know, which is, it's just, it's, it's a brutal, it's a business. And that's where it comes down to for people listening. You have to understand it's a business. The fortunate thing is there's multiple means to get into that business. Now um, there's, there's ways that you can still get in, especially if you write, you know, if you write something really good and there's a bunch of people that, you know, independent readers that aren't, aren't your family, aren't your friends, but you go out there and you get a good list of beta readers and they, they, they know that genre and they really think you wrote something well. And then for the next year or six months, you get doors slammed in your face. You still have options to be a published author. You can go to a small publisher. You, there are publishers out there that don't require agents. Um, the one thing I always tell people to be careful of is like vanity press. There's people out there that will take your money and they'll make you a published author, but the amount of money they're probably going to charge you, you can go be a published author, much less, much less. Take your little research. Maybe you might have to call in a few favors for some friends to help with some, to figure out some stuff. But with, again, the, 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 the downside is we have these things, but the positive on with these things is there's so much information out there that there's blueprints that you can follow um, if you, if you want to go that route. Yeah, that, that's basically what I did. So I finished the book and I said, well, how do I get it out there? So I was researching mid-level mid publishers and yeah. those kinds of things. And so I would just read books that they had published until I found one that seemed mm -hmm. to fit with my genre. Right. And that's how I found mine. So yeah. They, with Black Rose publisher? Black Rose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're um, they're really nice. They're mm -hmm. great people. But they weren't the, weren't the only one I submitted to, but they were the ones that took it. Yeah. 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 And then uh, as the authors that I met through Black Rose, it's, it's been extraordinary. So mm -hmm. the different journeys that people have been on, it's yep. been great. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it connects everyone, especially because we're on our, our, our paths are different, but we're all trying to kind of get to the same uh, top of a mountain basically. And, and some people, they don't care to go as high as the others. And there's, you know, it's, it's all subjective, um, but we're on a journey together. And we're all, you know, there's no one on this journey that writes something, let's say no one's always a bad thing to do, but there really is no one on the journey that writes one thing and their life is set and they never have another problem. They, they might, and I know multiple authors just in the last several years, that first book out, they got seven figure deals, book deals, or they got seven figure movie deals. And, you know, of course you get that and your part of you is going to say, well, I got the golden ticket. You did. But the downside on that golden ticket is they're going to want you to do a second book. And if that second book doesn't hit as well as that first book, it's a business. They're not going to give you a lifetime of books. You know, you're, you're better off. And I've told authors this, you know, you're better off with like a bell curve kind of thing. You, you want to rise up. If you start really high, going down is a bad direction in the publishing industry. Yes, it is. It's, it's very bad. So... So fortunately, I didn't start at the top, so I just can <laughs> climb to the top. And I, <laughs> but speaking of the top, because I I want to get into what you did. So you was this the first novel you ever complete? I know you wrote short stories and you wrote magazines. Is there other novels that are in your drawer that you weren't good enough, or you didn't no. believe in enough? No, no, 
Yeah. And the Merrill Engines was my first attempt, my first wow. book. Yeah. Yeah. And it, to be, to be honest, I, when I left screenwriting, I actually didn't do any creative writing for about a decade. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had given everything that I thought I had to give. Mm -hmm. It was one of those, no regrets. There was just, I looked back at everything and it was like, so pleased with every, everything that I, I tried everything. Right. So I was, I am a general manager for an essential business. And this was in September of 2020. Okay. COVID had, you know, been on the move. And mm -hmm. during that same time in Oregon, we were besieged with the worst wildfires that we had experienced in a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So during this particular Sunday, in the last Sunday of September 2020, I was at work with a coworker. Everyone else called out. So it's just two of us keeping the business open, wearing our masks, middle of the pandemic. And you couldn't even see outside because of the smoke from the wildfires. It was just hideous. Wow. And then my mom, my mom had called my work to say two of my cousins had to be evacuated from their homes and the fires were getting closer. Mm -hmm. And I stepped outside, not to be dramatic, but I just felt like the world was ending at that time. Like, here it is. It's, it's over. And I felt a great deal of personal shame mm -hmm. about my writing. I was like, I, sh I can't believe I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Okay. I didn't want to write another screenplay, so I just go into write a novel. Mm -hmm. I committed to myself outside, looking at the wildfires, smelling the smoke with the mask on my face, that I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I drove home and told my wife, and I said, Deborah, I have something to tell you that I'm going to write a book. And luckily, she just said, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my parents have always been my biggest supporters, always, for my writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and in life but the next day I drove over to the house and I told him what I was going to do and my dad frankly said we'll be disappointed in you if you don't do it wow you, you have to do this you have to do it yeah you have to do it so that that was the decision behind returning to uh to writing and I, it was I think I also say this in the acknowledgments it's like when Rocky said there's something in the basement uh, that's just how I felt. There's just something inside and I had to prove to myself, nobody else, that I could go the distance, that I could do this. Mm -hmm. That's what it was all about for me when I was working on this book. So where did the idea come from? Because it's it's very specific, obviously. It's something that takes place. It's a, it's a period piece, but just, you know, a after the Civil War and just so many pieces there that is, was that something that you had an interest in that time period or does it something that just came out of the the thought process of i want to write something and you just you know organically landed on what you wrote what you wrote yeah uh, actually um just a few days later at work i was on my lunch break and there was an article in one of our local newspapers the oregonian and it was about the nez Perce returning to their land after 200 years which is which is wonderful mm -hmm. but in that article there was a throwaway line and it said members of the nez Perce tribe joined a quarter million native americans in fighting in the civil war well i shamefully didn't know that hmm. I, I didn't know that piece of history Mm -hmm. So I, I immediately just stuck in my head and then I did some side research real quick. And as soon as that information popped up, I said, wow, mm -hmm. now that's a hero. Mm -hmm. That's a hero. Because the articles that I read right away was not only did they face racism and extreme violence on the battlefield, but sometimes they got it even worse when they got home to their tribes because they were considered traitors and everything right. else. So that was the genesis of the whole story right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So the research just kind of stemmed from there. Okay. And the more research I did, the more it grew. Because mm -hmm. I, I was not at all comfortable with wanting to do anything historical. Because all my scripts, everything was modern day, even mm -hmm. even, even some sci-fi. Wow. So it is very new territory for me. That's awesome, though. And that shows you, and probably, though, those years of screenwriting – um the growth that took place even though you had put it aside for for 10 years the growth for you as a writer manifested i believe in what you then did for your first novel and i i think that's awesome because i would assume I, I have a similar um my idea for where i came from the body man was one specific you know two lines basically of something and that just caused my imagination over about a three year three hour time period to like pretty much created the story, at least the beginning and end, what it ended up being, a, a, the middle 
the middle became, you know, kind of, I would just sit myself down at night and I just creatively knew where I needed to go, but I, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't like outlines. Um, and, and I know some people write 40,000 word outlines. Kyle Mills is one who was doing the Vince Flynn books for years. Um, he'll write basically, uh, almost half of a novel in an outline form. I couldn't do that personally. To me, I'm much more, or at least when I started, I was much more seat of the pants. I'm not as much of a pantser now, but I'm still generally a pantser. Um, but yeah, just getting that, 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 that simple idea to me is kind of the, the excitement for a project. So, so you did your research and just the more you dived into that research, the more creativity came out of like, cause just, the, and I don't want to give stuff away to people that haven't read it. Cause you, you do need to go out and read it, but um, we, we have a beast in this story. So how did, how did that come about? Cause when I first was reading it, I'm like, what is this? Oh my goodness. And then, I mean, your, your descriptiveness is phenomenal. So, you know, when, when, when someone's in a cave and something is about to happen, you know, it's creepy. You feel like you're in that cave and you don't want that thing to do what's about to happen to that character. So how did that come about? Well, when you're growing up in Oregon, um, Bigfoot Sasquatch is like the state animal, to be fair. I mean, <laughs> and it's gotten to the point now where you go to the store and there's Sasquatch candles and candy and underwear. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what store you're at. There's a Sasquatch. Right. Yes. If you look at the original Native American beliefs of it, especially up in Canada and Alaska area, um, mm -hmm. Sasquatch is a fierce protector of the forest. It's scary. Right. And that had not been represented to me because uh, we always think of the, like the Harry and the Hendersons version of uh, the Sasquatch family right. friendly. Yes. I knew I definitely wanted to go that way. Uh, just make gotcha. me an ex predator of the forest and just frightening. Mm -hmm. and, and when I decided on this story, I wanted to do a genre mishmash. So action, adventure, historical, thriller, and then horror. Mm -hmm. And when you write all three, you got to make sure all three are working. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've worked really hard to make them scary. So I, those are probably the most fun I had writing the book mm -hmm. with those, those sequences. Okay, how are we going to make these guys scary again? You know. Well, and that's how I think you did your, you said you, you did action and you did thrillers with screenwriting. That came really shining through in what you did with a period piece of having that action and that thrilling happening, but whether it be in the woods, in a cave, on a train, in a hot air balloon, a wagon. I mean, you kind of covered, you know, without the technology, you covered all the means of action that could take place yeah. back in that time period, basically. Yeah. And then some. You and then know. some. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. I do enjoy action. There was a few times, you know, I came out of the office with crestfallen face and I'd say to my wife, I, I just killed him. He's, I can't, he's not going to survive this. He can't, how does he survive this? But yeah, he's gone. He's done. You know, and I'd be stuck on the cliffhanger for, you know, maybe three or four days mm -hmm. before. Oh yeah, that's how he gets out. You know, and the, the fun part, of course, is not cheating the audience, not cheating the reader when there's right. like this, what you just have to make it somewhat believable, you know, mm -hmm. could Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you know, could he be in the mine car and <clears throat> jump it? Maybe, you know, but you get, I want to reach that point with an action hero, particularly Winterhawk. And the, I just want the reader to say, hey, it's Winterhawk. Of course, he'll, of course, he can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done. I, th I, th I think you did it very, very well. So it was gripping. And I, several people that I've talked to since I read it um, had very similar, very similar reactions. Um, you've done, I've, I've got a list of them here. I've got a, a cheat sheet over here of just the awards that it won, the, um, the praise that it got um, must, must be very validating of, especially for a first book. Because again, normally people have to write several before they kind of find their find their voice. I risk really, but I think maybe that that screenplay, that years of toiling on screenplays, I think really helped you. Even though it's a different genre in a way, I think that really helped establish your voice and that you're able to take that first novel and you're able to present it in a way that really connected with the audience. So, yeah, well, thank you. But certainly, a goal when I was starting this is I want to do an action movie, 80s action movie on the page. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, like the, the James Bond stunts, the Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger quips, 
the diehard action, like the monster from Predator or Leviathan, and just mm -hmm. kind of put this moral, spiritual character right in the center of this. Uh, so that was the fun part for me was just, you know, is this going to be cinematic when you're reading it? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm glad it succeeded that way. It did. Um, and you also, I know I saw it at some point there, not too many more, uh, or several months back, is you actually had a uh, ad or a billboard um, pop up there in Times Square, if I recall. I did. And it was on my birthday, October 13th. It was on, so, okay. It was, That's a good birthday great. present right there. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah. It played 88 times. And and for that day, uh, Winterhawk was the largest action hero in New York. That's it was pretty cool. Wonderful. Yeah. It, what, what was great about that too, was on my, on my birthday, the year prior, I had gotten a turn down from someone saying good writing, but there's no one ever going to read this. It's just, it's not a story or a character anyone's going to want to read. Mm-hmm. It's just great. A year later, all of a sudden, it's gotten some awards. People are reading it, and there it is on you know Times Square. Yeah. So it was wonderful. Well, again, it shows you that one person, what they might have to say, doesn't necessarily equate to what the masses are going to say. So, you know, I had I had one tell me, you know, can we make them, um, you know, half, just half Native American, half, <laughs> you know, like. The the intimation was that, you know, American readers aren't going to read about a Native American hero. It has to be like, it's like, wow, no, we can't. Because <laughs> yeah. one one thing I'm probably most proud of this character is there's no white savior in it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's him and him alone from right. beginning. To, you know, and I'm not, not making disparaging judgments on any race. I'm just saying it was really important to me that this was his story you know, he was the hero and nobody's going to help him get out of it. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. he had to do it on his own ingenuity. And just I, to me, probably one of my favorite scenes was involving the train, obviously. Um, I thought that was just so well, so well put together. And, you know, the gold that's there, we don't want to give it away for people, but the, you know, where's the gold, what's happening. Um, yeah. I think you, it's like, you know, die, die Hard mixed with you know Back to the Future Three mixed with you know a couple other a uh, couple other period pieces thrown in there. So Last sure. Mohicans even. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good. Yeah, I mean Mohicans is a top five favorite movie of mine, so that's definitely an inspiration. Well, yeah. you need to come visit me sometime, and we can go up. So they filmed it about uh, parts of it. They filmed it. I don't know, thirty minutes from where I live, forty minutes. Um, yeah, if you go up, uh, if you go up to Chimney Rock area, um, Lake Lure uh it's like Lur. yeah lake Lur. i think so i think i got that right yeah <laughs> so uh but a be beautiful area um and then of course daniel day lewis one of those actors that stays in character as he's as he's you know filming uh, dustin hoffman i think is one as well where if he's filming a character you know he was rain man for the entire time so they said cut and you still had to deal with rain man you know that evening and the next morning or whatever so yeah, I remember reading um, the making of back in 92 in a couple of magazines. And they would say Daniel Day-Lewis would just sleep outside. Uh, he was like there was, you know, he was trying to live it as much as he could. And he's a great actor. He is so good in that. Yeah. My thing about Mohicans is Wes Studi should have won an Oscar as Magua. He wasn't even nominated. I, I'll forever be upset about that. Yeah, I can understand. He is so um, good. So where do you go from here? What's what's the, you, you've you, you've you, you've got the goal you you during the during the fires you went outside you realized I have to do this so what do you have to do next or what what is being worked on now well the uh, as the, as you know in the book it's really a standalone adventure mm -hmm. hit, and what I wanted to do with it is almost like a reverse uh, origin story so the the Winter Hawk that we know from the epilogue is not the winter hawk that we see throughout the book so it's almost like he had to start a certain way to end a certain way so i was really happy with his arc and i didn't want to touch it so i was going to move on to a standalone and just do that at a couple of my first signing events um there were so many people that came up to me to say oh we, we can't wait for the sequel this is going to be serious right and of course, my publisher had reached out to say we would really like it if you know you would do the sequel first and then a standalone. Right. Um, so that's what I'm working on now is okay. the sequel. Um, it takes place 30 years later. Uh, Winterhawk's uh, daughter is the the new mm -hmm. hero, and it's her her adventure, her story. Wow. 
yeah, still have the monsters. It's still historical. Um, it's just a different, slightly different time period, different bad guys, slightly different hero. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be out in April of 2025. Okay. Yeah. April 17th to be exact. So you got the date. Okay. Awesome. So how is it? So what's been the feeling, you know, like we just talked about briefly, but so getting that, you know, kind of got that monkey off your back in a way that you, you wanted to, this is something that you realized you didn't achieve that you wanted to Um, talk through how that, you know, was there a relief there? Was there just the excitement and, and did, what did the excitement transition into? Did you want to then just, okay, that felt so great. I want to do that again or. Yeah. I mean, so writing the book, um, I know mileage varies for every author. It took me 17 months Mm -hmm. to do the first draft. And then after that, after the rewrites took me about six months for, you know, black Rose to reach out to say, let's do it. Yeah. So in between that time, it was like, okay, yes, I did this. I want to see it in print. And then that disappointment and that rejection was coming through again. It was like, here I go again, here, Mm -hmm. here I go again. Right. But I'm going to see it through. So that morning, November 17th, the day I won't forget, (laughs) got an email from Black Rose and it's, you know, your contract. And I don't know how many hours I cried. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I was so emotional. Yeah. Absolutely emotional. Uh, and again, my parents being the supporters they were, I sent a uh, text or cryptic message that morning, said, I, I, there's something I need to talk to you about this morning. Of course, they thought it was super serious. And <laughs> I I played the part. So I came you in with, with their heads as, as best you could. I did. I came in with my phone and I held it to my dad and I said, I just need you to read something. And boy, you should have seen that reaction. It was like two seconds later. It was like, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, like you said, the, that is off my back that someone believed in me enough to have it published. I got the book done. People are enjoying the book. Yeah. So now, now the challenge is, can I do doing a second book? Yeah. Coming up with new, new action and things like that. It's, it's hard. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. I, I just, for myself, my, uh, I've put a novella out last year but my follow-up to The Body Man is coming out uh, June 18th. And so over the last month, I sent out... I, I've Advanced readers have already had it a while back. I had a whole journey of trying to get the second book published. Um, but in the past month, as I have did some more re-edits and stuff, I said, well, I want a fresh set of eyes. So I gave out about 15 copies um, starting the middle of last month, so about 30 days ago. Um, and I told everyone, you have until the Ides of March. Ides of March is my cutoff. Whoever gets back with me, if you find problems, if you have concerns, snide comments, don't worry, I have thick skin, lay it out. The most common, I've heard back from more than half of them, um, and most of those people read it within a week, honestly. Um, and the most common comment I got from multiple sources was, there is no sophomore slump here. And that really makes you feel good because it's pretty, especially if you have a book that's pretty well received, and, and you obviously have that. You know, you don't want your next book to come out and people be like, you know, what, what, what? Wow, good, good that you had the first one, but you know, you couldn't keep it going with the second one. So, you know, you you want to hear it means a lot to get that positive reinforcement when the second one comes out. That, and I think it also, and with you with your experience, I don't think that's an issue because I think you kind of know what you need to do, and you have the uh, the experience of of doing it once. It, and you have the, to me, you have the confidence and you should have the confidence in what you wrote as well. But, but you still don't know. You don't know if people are going to read it and are they going to feel that passion that you have? Um, and that's the vulnerab- vulnerability of what we do because we have a certain period of time to, especially with the first novel, you have your whole life to write your first novel. And then once that first novel comes out and if it's well received, and like for you, you're found, you know, the publisher is like, hey, Dave good job. Let's do another one. Let's do it. Let's do a series. Cause you know, series is how people make money and that's right. what this is about. Um, well then you don't have, you can't wait, you know, 15 years for your next one out or nobody will remember that you had a first one out. So you kind of get put on the clock and that puts, I think a, a challenge or a little bit of a stress on authors of going, man, okay. I had years to write that first novel. I have like six months now to write the second one or, you know, maybe a little longer, but not, you don't have years like you did at first. So 
I mean, there, there's a crazy stat out there. It's like 70% of uh, first-time authors never write a second book because they can't get over that um, yeah. feeling that it's not good enough, people won't like it. Right. Uh, so they, they just can't finish it. So it's, it's a scary stat that yeah. so many authors can't do it. Right. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad yours has been so well received. Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see when the when the when the sales start in June. <laughs> so pre sales are doing good though. I'm doing. I'm the pre sales are solid. So again, I'm I'm blessed to to be in that position. And um, I know, and it's not arrogance. I just I know I have the confidence in once I was able to do it and put my thoughts down. I knew going forward, I'd be able to do it again. Um, again, at some point, maybe I hit the, maybe I do hit a wall where I'm like, I just don't, but I've also done since, since the body man came out, I've had multiple other books I've either finished or started. So I've got like three in the hopper right now that are in various stages, which is a horrible way. I would have never done that years ago, but just the way my life is working now. Cause like, like with yourself, okay, I have a full-time job. Um, I've got two kids. I have custody when I, when I don't have my kids. I have free time like this weekend. I'm on my kids so I can do a podcast with you. I can work on my writing projects. But then during the week when I have my day job, that's my job. So I have evenings. But if I have my kids, I don't have that evening. So I have to be very disciplined with what I do when I do it and especially working on projects. And what I found at least is there's a few projects I've started and I've just gotten to the point where I'm like, you know, I know where I want to go, but I still have to figure out stuff in the middle. And until I figure out that stuff, I'm just going to put it aside. Now, six, seven years ago, if I had done that, I either A, wouldn't have ever done it, picked it back up, or B, I probably would have lost confidence that I could pick it back up. Now it's not the case. Now I've been able to pick up some of those projects every several months and either make notes or write chapters and then put it back aside and jump to another project. Um, at the end, I'll find out if that was beneficial or not. When I have a finished manuscript, I'm like, what the heck did I do? Um, but the one thing that I've tried to encourage people as I've been doing podcasts and doing stuff for years is that, you know what? You can't fix something you don't write. So finish a first draft and then you can go fix your boo-boos. You can have people tear it apart and say, man, you this storyline's not completed or you didn't do this part. But if you don't get it to a spot where you have a draft for yourself or others to look at, then like you mentioned, and, and which is very true, most people start something and then never finish it. So like your acknowledgements have in there, you know, which I think, you know, I implore you to not give up. And that's the same thing. I've been telling people never quit, which I got from another author years ago. Just don't quit. If it's something you believe in, then it must be important, even if it's only important to you. And at the end of the day, if it's important to you, then do it for yourself. Do it for mm -hmm. the sense of accomplishment that you're going to do. And you don't know what's going to happen. Doing that, might open up a door for you. George Clooney might call Dave at some point and say, okay. Dave, I like what you have here. Such okay. and such handed me this book and we want to turn it into a screenplay. And Dave can be like, hey, I know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> That's another question I did have for you is with your screenplay experience, do you have any thought processes on making this into a screenplay or have you done that? I have not done that, okay. um, but I definitely could do it, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I haven't. I haven't thought that way at all. Okay, there's certainly some aspects of the book when I was writing it. I was like, I was. I'm glad I don't have to adapt this one. <laughs> I mean, I'd have to really pause and do it. But you know, back to what you're saying about writing on multiple things, I totally agree with that. And when people talk to me about writer's block, I think the worst thing you can do is stop writing. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is just okay, put a pause and move on, move on to something else. It still keeps you writing. And it still keeps you moving forward. I I do that all the time. Yeah. I, I just think that's the best thing to do. 100%. But if, if you stop, you just, you may stop, stop, stop. Right. So, yeah. Just, well, you, okay. might get you might get complacent. You might be like, you know what? It's really hard to write. So it's easier to turn on Netflix. And for anyone that gets to that point, turn Netflix off. Turn it off. Stop paying yeah. it. Cancel your subscription. If you're supposed to be a writer, then write. Now, if you're writing and you want to tweet, you want you want to cheat a little bit now and then and watch, you know, the new Formula One F series or, you know, a bunch of other things. Yeah. Get, have a treat. Watch a little something before you go to bed. Um, but yeah, no, currently. So let's see. What do I got? 
So breach of trust, I'm starting to get the feedback. So I've got uh, the next couple of weeks, I'll start going through everyone's feedback. And it's been very kind so far. I have a couple couple people going like, this isn't complete. And not even, I don't even have any complete. This is a little confusing. Can you clarify this part or that part? And they're very small little tweaks. So I'll work on that. Um, I have another book coming out in the fall that or late fall, early winter that has to do with the novella I came out last year. So a different set of characters. Um, I'm writing a short story. I'm trying to write a song, which is another project I can't talk about. So it's like, yeah, there's like four things in the hopper. And years ago, that probably would have stressed me out. And I probably wouldn't have done any of them because I would have just given in and thought of this is such a daunting task. Now I've compartmentalized those things enough now where it's like, okay, tonight you're working on your short story. Okay, tomorrow you're going back to edits on Breach of Trust until it's done or whatever. And it kind of, at this point, it motivates me and it pushes me. Um, and I think it helps that I've had success in putting stuff out that I can draw back on that. And so I can tell myself, hey, you know what you're doing. Even if I don't know what I'm doing, I can convince myself I know what I'm doing. And I did. At some point, I have known what I was doing. So I can draw off that. Um, and I think that's one thing that helps us versus that person that's listening to us that hasn't finished a project. It's very easy to fall into that self-doubt or just listening to when people talk and they go, man, this is such a daunting process. Trying to get an agent is so hard. Then trying to get a publisher when you're on sub to accept that manuscript is so hard. And that's where people just need to learn and, and know from the get-go it is really hard. But you know what? If this is what you're supposed to do, then see it through. And if that door closes, another door can open, but it will not open if you don't do the work. It just won't mm -hmm. happen. That's right. Yeah. Yep. You have to be disciplined and committed yeah. all the time. You know? I see your posts when you're going to the gym. I'm the same way. You know, you, you have to be committed to wake up and go. You got to drive when you don't want to be there. Yep. Sweat when you don't want to sweat. You know, that's partially because Eric got lazy for a few years and put on some extra pounds. And now I'm 47 and it's, they're just, they don't fall off. I don't wow. know why that's not the case. My metabolism is just a, it doesn't matter if I starve myself, they still don't fall off. I'm like, well, this sucks. And it's like, okay, go to work, <laughs> go to the, go to the gym. <laughs> yeah. And you always feel better uh, when you leave. You always feel that sense of accomplishment that you did it. I, today I feel that with my writing, I really wasn't uh, motivated sitting down on the computer, but I sure felt better. Right. After the hours were done, it's like, I did it. I got this chapter done. I didn't think I could do. Yeah. I've literally driven. So for me, it's about a 16 minute drive to Planet Fitness. I've literally left my house night. I didn't have the kids drove, drove in there, driven there, excuse me, um, sat in the parking lot and tried to convince myself, you know, it's late. Just come back tomorrow. And it's happened multiple times. And every time it's happened, I've been like, dude, get your lazy butt in there and go work out. And, you know, I come out 30, 45 minutes, an hour later. And I, I literally have a brief conversation in my head of going, you feel great. Why did you think of not going? Why, why did you almost not go in there? And then the next time that happens, I go right back to that memory of going, remember last time when you didn't want to go work out, you felt good. You drove here, you just spent money in gas, lock the car, go inside, put in the work and maybe you'll, maybe you'll shed a pound fatty. <laughs> so my motivational works the words are working for myself so <laughs> that's good i mean sometimes you need that drill instructor voice in your head like yeah. go now you right. know or when you're on the treadmill you're on the stair climber and it's like oh turn it down turn it down it's like no keep going, keep going. you know yeah and a lot of that that you learn at the gym is you learn as a writer too it's a sentence at a time it's a word at a time and and right cliche you always read it's like uh you always read about saying oh i got 50 pages done and it's great um but you got to get those 50 pages done. You got to sit down and do the work. And even if it's just a sentence, there are, there are some days when I was working on a uh, layer of legends where I maybe had five minutes in a day, five minutes only. I was working doubles, mm -hmm. mute, you know, but at least it was five minutes. I got something down. Right. Some, yeah. It's, it's all about yardage. There's no touchdowns when you're an author. No, you, it's, it's slow yardage up the field. And yep. you just got to always know that. The gym is the same way. Yeah. Well, there's few few words a day. I mean, especially if you start writing, you realize that, man, 500 words isn't crazy. You know, maybe in high school or, or junior high, if you write a 500-word paper, you'd be like, oh, my goodness, this is so daunting. 
once you exercise the brain muscle and you start putting words down, you can knock 500 words out. You know, even maybe if you're even slow, maybe it's an hour. Okay, maybe. But 500 words every day, or if you want to take the Sabbath off, take off a seventh day, but six days a week, man, if you put 500 words down, it doesn't take a year to finish a, a, a manuscript. Now, no. again, doesn't mean the manuscript's good enough to be be published. Doesn't mean, you know, you created something Hemingway, something Shakespeare, amazing, whatever. But still, if you stay to it and you stay committed to it, you can have something in your hands that you can then mold if it needs the molding. Um, and you don't know, maybe that first draft is really good and it just needs a, you know, a copy edit. Anything's possible. But if you don't I'd put in that, that writer. what's that? I'd like to meet that writer where the uh, first, is, you know, boom. Now they don't really exist, but we want to tell people they exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Um, hey, I want to be sensitive to your time. I appreciate you coming on, but I've all the new, all the interviews I've done so far, I end with the same question for you. A um, little bit of a different wording for each person, maybe, but um, I think you might agree with me that our life really is a book. You have a first page, you have a last page. Nobody knows how many pages they get between those first and last page. But Dave, you are a writer. So you get to write that last page. What does that last page say? That people were inspired that I never gave up. And in their own life, they looked at that as a way to push forward mm -hmm. through challenges. Yeah, that to me, that'd be the greatest accomplishment for me. Awesome. Well, I, I think the way you ended this is the way we can end it. Hope is a superpower. Never take off that tape. Powerful words, my friend. Thank you for writing them. Thank you for having me on, Eric. I appreciate yeah. it. So uh, real quick, because we want to sell you some books. So where do people go to find you to find what's the best way to buy the novel? Well, if you go to my website, davidbuzan.com, uh, it's got a link where you can go you know, Barnes and Noble or Amazon or Pal Books here in Portland, um, a bunch of different places. But to me, that's just centralized right there, lets you know where everything is. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Dave. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Bye.